Hi, I'm Jason Evanish, and this is the Practical Product Podcast. We aim to be the most actionable podcast on product management you'll ever hear. Uh, this week, we have a very awesome guest, uh, my longtime friend, Lazar. He is a serial founder and has 15 years of experience across e-commerce, hardware, online publishing, online marketplaces, fintech, and even SaaS. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Serbian Entrepreneurs because he is Serbian himself, even though he's now here live with me here in Austin, Texas. And that Serbian Entrepreneurs Group is a nonprofit that connects 300 plus tech co founders and investors of Serbian descent across nine chapters in five countries. And he's also an avid reader and history buff, as I know very well, as we have many times met up and I've gotten detailed history of Serbia and the entire region in Europe. And I'm really excited to have him on the podcast because <clears throat> Lazar and I have a habit of getting together about once a month to have wide ranging conversations about interesting topics. And so we finally decided we should get together and actually record an episode because we figured some of these conversations might be interesting to other people. And that's why today we're talking about uh, chat GPT and the future of AI. What does it mean for the future of work? And specifically, what does it mean for product managers? Because I think a lot of the rules about what work is like, what your products may need to be able to do are all going to change. So Lazar, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Cool. So there's so much we could cover today. I think we're going to go for about an uh, hour and a half, maybe two hours in here. But um, let's go. Yeah. <clears throat> if you've been following things on Twitter or anywhere else lately, you know, everybody's talking about ChatGPT. Uh, you may have also seen things like Dale um, that are doing really cool stuff where essentially you prompt an AI and it comes back with something awesome, whether it be ChatGPT giving you a really interesting answer or potentially generating images that are actually useful and usable as is or with very light editing. And so it seems like a really exciting time to be talking about that. So let's maybe start with talking about chat, chat GPT because that seems to be the the hottest one lately. And so I'm curious, Lazar, um, have you gotten a chance to play around with it? What have you found has been uh, interesting or most useful with it? How are you thinking about chat GPT in particular? Uh, I think it's awesome. I mean, I definitely played with it like everybody else in tech, like over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, and it's great because a lot of people who haven't had a chance to, who hadn't had a chance to play with uh, GPT three directly, are actually getting exposed now because it's like you know a very simple interface, kind of like you know just a chat box basically. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it demonstrates the power of uh, AI to a very wide audience who may not even be technical and may not even know, you know how to spin up like um, an API call uh, set. Um, so in that sense, um, it's, it's pretty interesting because like also it's, it opens like all sorts of cans of worms, right? So people are uh, making it do all sorts of things. So for example, like uh, um, there was a guy who uh, actually had the uh, chat GPT take uh, the USMLE test, which is United States Medical Licensing Exam test. Yeah. And um, AI scored 70%. So you know, right, like, what does that mean? Because, like, it, you know, if you look at, like, general practitioners, they make for, like, 59% of uh, mm -hmm. uh, medical pros in the U.S. And suddenly some of those things could possibly get automated, right? Yes, yes. I, I know there's uh, something actually I talked about in an earlier episode where I was doing some rants for the podcast. Uh, I talked about how uh, uh, Noah Yuval Harari of Sapiens fame, who is now a darling of the uh oh crap what are they called uh they're so evil it's klaus schwab oh uh, wef uh, world economic Farm. Yeah, yeah so he's a huge he's a huge part of the wef and he literally says that there's going to be a useless class of people he literally calls them useless uh that are going to emerge because ai is going to take all the jobs um i think it's definitely very interesting how these things can be like auxiliary and supportive of people but i would say i'm firmly in the camp of actually uh, it's misguided to think that all the, like we're just gonna no one's gonna have any work. AI is gonna do everything. I think it's much more likely like Lazar. I believe the phrase you like to use is the centaur. Correct. In that it's going to uh, be a hybrid world where we use a little bit of a, a little bit of both. Certainly, I think it gives credence if something is seventy percent on the United States medical licensing exam. That means it was wrong thirty percent of the time. Yeah, so, but it also means it's gonna be at a hundred percent like in a year or two, right? Uh, you would hope. And I think that's one of the interesting questions is like, if you try this on things, some things it's spot on. Like if you're trying to code up something and you need a simple 
uh, explanation for how, how to code something up. It's uh, from what I've seen as the examples, it's fantastic as a teacher actually, mm -hmm. or a tutor explaining those things and giving you those elements and getting in like explaining error messages and things like that. But then here, you know, you have that example of, well, it's off by 30%. It got 30% of the questions wrong. Well, why is that? Is it an easy thing for the AI to learn or is it something that's more subjective and, and a human element still needs to be involved? Right. Uh, so uh, going back to your point about like uh, uh, most professions turning into centaurs like over yeah. the next few years um, and talking about the medical profession specifically, um, I, I actually have like an interesting story about this. So a couple of yeah. years ago, I met with a team of um, a Serbian um, uh, founders uh, in Belgrade who were interested in building um, an AI powered tool for dental implants. And their thing was like, um, uh, I think a good um, good illustration of what could happen like you know, in a lot of um, um, areas of, uh, of the medical field, which is basically like, um, their thing is like, uh, so if you look at dental implants, they're like the most lucrative uh, market within that part of medicine. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they still, uh, like once you do the CT scans and you have like all the 3D files of your um, jaw and like everything around it, uh, basically you still need like a very, very experienced oral surgeon to take a look at those and estimate like, you know, okay, so like we're gonna need this type of standardized dental implant. Mm -hmm. It's gonna uh, go in under this angle and yeah. all the other uh, parameters it needs but turns out there aren't too many of those people around right so you end yeah. up uh, uh, with a lot of surgeries just ha having to wait because once you have those parameters uh, the way i understood it basically like most uh, oral surgeons or in some cases even just like regular dentists could actually execute on that but they just need that piece of information mm -hmm. so their intention was okay we're just going to train uh, this on like a bunch of anonymized data yeah. um, because we know like which uh, implants worked and you know how they uh, performed and so forth and train um, uh, a model which which could identify once you feed it like CT scan files right. exactly what you need to do so I, I think that that's very smart because it allows you to essentially like eliminate that bottleneck right. and still you could have like those um, oral surgeons who are super um, experienced actually like take a look at that and kind of like you know approve disapprove like you know figure out like what makes most sense but the, at the end of the day you are still like speeding up the entire process getting more people into surgeries faster yeah so i think that's where a lot of heavy lifting will be happening like on the ai side yeah um but that's how she say like that's a that's just one part of my thesis. Another sure. part is like we're also going to see like a resurgence of um, um, professions which are tied to the physical world. Yeah. Because those are at the moment something that like AI cannot touch, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the thing though is that like uh, you can look at like a great example. One of the very first things that like AI really took advantage of. Uh, was copywriting mm -hmm. because it's like if you can learn the AIDA method and some of these other methods like and you read a lot of websites on the internet like AI can very quickly learn how to do those things totally but what's really fascinating is um there was someone who, who posted on Twitter like hey all like copy AI and these companies are like blowing up they're building in public they're talking about how much money they're making they're like this is great and then they're like wait a second is anybody losing their job on this you know, how, how are people using this? Are, you know, did you not hire somebody or did you fire somebody because you had this tool? And universally, like a thread with like hundreds of replies was everybody saying, this is useful. It is making my job easier, but it is not replacing anything. Like you still need someone to curate. You need someone to proofread, use it to generate ideas and you choose the five best ones. You know, there, there's this curation aspect that is still very human. And while it may get it improved, I think it still sits back and you say, wait a second, how many people do you know that are literally full-time copywriters and that's all they do versus they're a marketer, they wear anywhere from a few to a dozen hats mm -hmm. and copywriting is one thing that they have to do amidst many, at which point then you're like, well, wait a second, if you take what maybe would take them a whole afternoon to do and now they can do it in 30 minutes, they're not out of a job. <laughs> well, They've got I, plenty I, of other things on their to-do list to get to, right? Right. I, I'm going to play a devil's advocate here sure. for a second. So just to give you like a counter example. So yeah. um, on Tuesday, I needed a very complex three-way NDA for one of my companies. Yeah. And essentially, like, I, I knew that if I were to uh, hire a lawyer at that point, like I'm looking, especially because the holiday season is approaching. So like, you know, yeah. I'm possibly looking at like a few weeks mm -hmm. out getting it and I needed literally that like 
like that day. Right. And in addition to that, like, you know, also, you know, the lawyers cost money and yes. all that. So I literally had like chat GPT uh, uh, generate the whole thing for me. So I literally went end to end from like, you know, just knowing what I need to having like the final thing that was sent to everyone and everyone just like signed it and, you know, it was good um, within like 20 minutes. Did you have uh, any type of legal expert review it at all to make sure it was good? Well, if, if you don't count, count myself, uh, probably not. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess for me, uh, my risk tolerance would say I'd at least want a human to double check right, that. Right. Um, no, I, I, I want to say like, you know, having been an entrepreneur, entrepreneur for a very long time, like uh, I, I've seen a fair share of like uh, legal sure. contracts. And in this case, it wasn't something which was like, you know, 80 pages long or something. It, yeah. it ended up at like three pages. So okay. I was able to go over the whole thing, see if everything makes sense if it lines up with like you know um, the things which I've seen previously mm -hmm. um, there were some uh, phrases which were in there which uh, I hadn't seen before so I thought mm, maybe like it just made it up which mm -hmm. is a point I want to go back to in a second yeah. but basically like, uh, and then I googled that and sure enough there were legal phrases which actually do fit that specific use case nice. um, and in terms of like uh, AI making things up so that's like yeah. um, Going back to uh, the topic of how accurate Chat GPT is right. and GPT three as a model, um, I found it like exceedingly um, impressive in terms of getting like technical things right mm -hmm. and summarizing and doing like a lot of these things. But at the same time, uh, I also found some areas where it, where it, how should I say, like not even like underperformed, but did even worse than that. Mm -hmm. Outright lying in some cases. So you know, being a history buff, as you very well know, yes. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah. I, I basically like. Uh, um, I basically also put it as ringers, just like, you know, asking it obscure facts of like European history. Yeah. And in some cases it would literally bring up, like it would make up like years and kind of like, you know, a thing, uh, a say complete untruths and all that. Wow. And I, when I would call it out on it, yeah. like it would be like, no, 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 but you know, this organization is a pre uh, uh, predecessor of this organization. I'm like, yeah, but it didn't exist in that year. And, yeah. and it would just kind of like try to wiggle away that way. So that's the part which, Kind of like I feel uneasy about, and and yeah. and that's why um, even though it's optimized for chat, um, you know there are some areas where where it doesn't really perform that well. Right. And but at the same time, um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen like some of those uh, use cases where people uh, were uh, making sure they have like. Uh, uh, they use like the strengths of a GPT-3 in, in the chatbot mode. Uh, so they were like spin up like their own personal therapist or something. Yeah. So, you know, instead of paying what, like 300, 400 uh, <laughs> uh, dollars per uh, um, a therapy session, yeah. they would essentially just, you know, keep paying like GPT-3 uh, API in the role of uh, 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 therapist and just, you know, do their own therapy that way, basically. Uh, I don't know if I would necessarily do that, but, you know, it's it's an interesting use case for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to think about some of these applications and then the risk of like running astray where it's like you do you may not want to have complete trust in them because you don't know, which is where I think that like human curation is going to continue to be important. Like it it, it still helps. Like for instance, uh many many years ago uh when I was in college, I interned at a a uh, medical device company. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they had invented was a system that would uh, scan mammograms mm -hmm. um, for, for, for women and um, basically it would flag them. And what it would do is they optimized it for uh, false negatives. Mm -hmm. So they never wanted to miss a lump that a doctor needs to look at. Sure. But that was at the expense of some false positives. But what they did is they made it so instead of a, a doctor having a stack of like 250 of these to look at and then it taking them hours, it was cutting that stack of 250 down to the 25 most important the doctor could That's look awesome. at. And that meant that instead of the doctor looking at one and like just flying through them, trying to get through a massive pile, they knew that each one deserved more care and attention and allowed them to then reduce the number of times where a doctor would miss on the mammogram that there there was something needed to look into. And it was much less tedious for the doctor to look at those last 25 and figure out which were like the 11 or 12 were like, oh, there's something here. Um, and so like, I think that there is, this is a lot of what's informed me across multiple examples I've seen in my life where I feel like, no, it's one, uh, human plus AI is like one plus one equals three. Mm -hmm. Either one individually runs risks, whether you're talking about the, the AI risk or uh, of them being wrong or misleading, um, 
or, you know, other people talk about just like flat out, like, oh, you know, people just aren't going to have any value at all to add to the chain. It's actually much like, you know, I was an electrical engineer as an undergrad, like, dude, graphing calculator, I wouldn't even be able to do half the stuff <laughs> I got a degree in um, if I didn't have a graphing calculator to help me. Right. And it's like, well, the graphing calculator did some pretty important stuff, but I was still a part of that input. And so I, I think that a, uh, a, it will be interesting to see how AI emerges, where what are the things that, yes, you can train it, and where do you hit those upper limits? Like, I know because I was nosy and asked questions as an intern that the whole reason they designed that mammogram scanner the way they did is because at first they wanted to do everything and they couldn't get within FDA tolerances. So the device was never going to get approved if it was going to just be standalone and replace the doctor. Right. They only actually were able to get within S FDA rules when they realized, like, wait a second, why replace the doctor when instead we make the doctor 10 times more efficient. Exactly. That's the same issue that the dental implant guys um, encountered. Yeah. They were basically, okay, so like um, automating the thing like 100% wasn't really like going to fly. So yeah. Um, but I also think like one, one of uh, uh, just kind of like talking about like AI in the field of medicine, I think what's going to also happen is like we're going to see a lot of like new discoveries as well because um, I just read the other day that basically like uh, um, we hadn't known that like uh, uh, retinas of uh, males and females actually like uh, differ. We thought, you know, eyes kind of like the same organ, same thing. Yeah. But then um, an AI model actually was able to identify precisely whether um, uh, uh, an eye uh, belonged to like, you know, a uh, male or female based on uh, just like scanning the retina. So, and it was accurate in 80% of um, uh, cases, which is... Interesting. So it seems, you know, it's, it definitely beats like the statistics. Yes. So there has to be like some difference that we're entirely unaware of. And yeah. I'm sure we're going to see like a lot of these new things happen as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly their observation skills are different than ours. So like, totally. I mean, if you ever think about how the human brain works, whether you talk about how we, how and why we form memories or how we process information, like our brains are as lazy or as efficient as they have to be. Totally. Um, which means that like, rather than, you know, even just thinking about the, the room we're in for recording this, it's like at any given time, if my brain wanted to, you know, it could pay attention to the number of different cameras, the lights behind us, uh, your shoes, my laptop, any of these things. But what generally happens is the brain goes like, no, 95% of this isn't important. We're going to focus on just the 5%. Like I'm looking at Lazar's yeah. facial reactions here. Um, and so what's interesting is that's not how, as far as I understand it, AI actually approaches it. it it's all, it's always potentially ingesting as much information as it can. And so there are times where our focus is valuable and there are times where being able to take everything in is actually more valuable. Yeah, and n not to forget that also like, you know, talking about like human vision, you actually have a hole in your vision where optical nerve goes into your eye yeah. and then your brain just paints over that and you're, you're essentially not perceiving like the full uh, field of view really. Exactly. So uh, let, let's talk about uh, the... the um, pictorial side sure. of, of AI for a second here. So, so chat GPT, I think there's been a lot of really fascinating stuff and that's been the hot, uh, the hot thing on, on, on Twitter lately because people just want to an ask it lots of questions. But one that I've seen that's been kind of a slow burn over the last couple of months has been the feed it a sentence. And, uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones that are doing it, um, where then they'll do things like generate 3d assets, uh, generate a video, uh, create mood boards. If you're a designer looking for inspiration, uh, creating app icons, um, uh, Peter Levels uh, has his generative uh, avatars app. Like you see all of those um, and you can see where like graphic design is, is definitely taking an interesting leap. So I'm curious, Lazar, uh, you know, have you gotten to play with some of those? What are your, what are your thoughts on the potential with that? Yeah, going back to uh, uh, that thing about like most professions m turning into centaurs, uh, one of the curious things I discovered is like uh, that Dali uh, as, a, as an AI uh, doesn't really know, uh, doesn't understand centaurs. So if you <laughs> ask it to generate a centaur, you're just going to get like a regular rider on a regular horse. Uh, which is funny because recently I wanted to generate an image of a centaur and yeah. ended up having to uh, feed it something something already existing and then change it enough and have it kind of like, you know, dream some of the alternatives and whatnot. But out of the box, it doesn't seem to know what a centaur is. But yeah, um, I think generative AI is definitely an interesting field. Yeah, And you can already see like how some of the, um, how should I say, like... Um, 
AI in general is going to cause a lot of tensions like uh, in the world like over the next few years. Yes. Um, but you can already see how like digital artists are uh, making like a pushback uh, against it. Like mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are posting these like no AI with kind of AI written and crossed out. Um, yeah. To their profiles like on, on different uh, digital art websites yeah. um, or opting to have their art taken away from, uh, taken out from the training data set. There are even dedicated websites for that to understand yeah. now. And, um, but still, I, I think like it will still march on like in, in many cases. And the question is, again, like, you know, where, where it lands, right? Mm -hmm. Is it just going to like 10x or 20x or 100x like uh, um, some artist's speed? Or is it going to replace some which do some highly technical repetitive task which models can be trained to do and then just right. empower the ones who don't do that and do something else and kind of like automate that part away? Um, and in, in that sense, like uh, I, another question which I think is especially relevant to, to your listeners um, is, you know, as a PM, how do you differentiate in that world? Because if you look at yeah. like most <laughs> of these, um, most of these uh, generative AI products, like, a lot of them are really hitting up like you know same APIs really like for uh, you know they don't, they don't, they're not really running their own proprietary stuff under the hood. It's just kind of like you know a standardized off the shelf solution that anyone can use. Yeah. So um, building a moat uh, for your product is gonna become like a very interesting and very um, complex question for a lot of PMs because if you look at it, it's like you know my favorite example is Jasper, right? So uh, <laughs> they're competing in the same uh, sandbox as uh, Copy.ai, so yep. like they're generating co uh, copy for for products. For, you can generate blog posts and like uh, email copy, micro copy, whatever. Um, but their thing is like the, so we're talking about the startup which uh, at the last valuation they are worth 1.5 billion dollars. Yeah. And, and I don't want to sound like disparaging or anything, but I can literally build the same thing in a weekend using Bubble. Yeah. So, you know, how do you differentiate then aside from being first to the market? So that I think that's going to be like a very important question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think to some extent there's opportunities to like narrowly train what you're doing mm -hmm. and and have, have that advantage because your training data set is better, but obviously that's getting more democratized and they're figuring out more ways to feed in. So like that may be a temporary lead. Um, I think that obviously brand is gonna matter a lot. If you can build a community aspect mm -hmm. to what you're doing, um, if you can get your users to help be a part of the training, I think that will also help because in theory, uh, you know, when you think about a moat, if you have some, uh, large audience that starts and somebody has to start from zero and that audience yourself is also steadily helping contribute to the improvement of the model within your system then that even if it's you know starting to to trail off because there's less to optimize right. it's still putting you further up the curve that they have to catch up I and, think you're right. You, yeah. we, I think we're already seeing some of that. I mean, for example, you brought up uh, uh, Peter Level's uh, yeah. avatar AI. Yeah. Um, the thing is, like, you know, if you look at the product itself when it's when it's when it launched, um, it wasn't using like anything like super original. It was just like front end for Astria AI, which was mm -hmm. what r ran all the models. And it was funny as uh, Astria kept uh, raising their prices, uh, Peter would just like double his prices to kind of like match their uh, new yeah. pricing because of its newfound popularity. Um, so in, in that sense, like, yeah, I, I can definitely see that. I mean, like, he, you know, good on him. Like he, he's still doing what, like 70K uh, per month or something like crazy like that, like off of the uh, Avatar uh, website, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess the challenge with him is that like, uh, what brings people back? Like you get, I've seen a bunch of people try it out. Mm -hmm. And like, I tried out some stuff last night mm -hmm. and like, you know, one of them was like, oh yeah, it's like nine bucks a month or like 50 bucks a year. And I was like, I don't know if I'm even gonna use this. Right. Like I just paid the nine bucks. I literally canceled last night because like I tried three or four things. They all look like trash. And it mm -hmm. was like, this was cool. This was good prep for a show. But like, I didn't feel like any of it was usable. And I tried everything from, I was like, well, you know what? Like, let's see if we can make an icon for my software company, Lighthouse, from right. like a mobile app. Okay, cool. It made some stuff that I would consider, like I would think a junior designer would come up with. Yeah, um, again, playing a devil's advocate here. Yeah. So I actually used Dali to generate a, a, a Two logos, which I actually use like in real products, like okay. over the last uh, few months. Okay. And uh, of course, it wasn't like the full thing. Like it was still a, this like centaur like situation where yeah. Dali sped up like a bunch of uh, uh, examples. Yeah. I, I generated probably I don't know, like 15 or 20. I liked only one. Right. I picked that one. I had it like vectorized like manually. Okay. And then also like tweak the colors a little bit. Right. And 
got the end result, which I was very happy with. But the thing is, like, it still required all of that extra massaging, Correct. right? Correct, exactly. And so I think that's an interesting, uh, again, that comes back to the whole, like, uh, one plus one equals three, because mm -hmm. that last bit of tuning is just required. I think there is the potential to build for that like editing be built. Like I, I definitely became clear to me, like when I started looking at, it was really cool. Some of the tweet storms I looked at of like designers who have started using this stuff. Mm -hmm. They, they were like, they use the alt text on Twitter, uh, for each image to tell you what the query was. Right. And I looked at it and I'm like, Oh, this is in English. Like, <laughs> like, like it's not like at this point in my life, I've gotten very good at Google search. Like I know how, I know how to just find stuff. And like, so I know a lot of tricks and, and, and ways to get Google search to return what I'm really looking for. At least at this point in time, I think a lot of these generative image AI ones are the same because like some of the things that they were putting in there, whether it be mentioning phrases like dribble and stuff, which I don't know if that tells it to check dribble or like- No, like no, that. no, that, that's the thing. Like it, it just uh, tells it to try to match the feeling of oh, yeah. dribble. Um, but what is interesting about it, I think like, uh, and that's something I, I believe you're hitting uh, upon right now is, um, I've seen all sorts of these like prompt markets uh, uh, spring yeah. up and I don't really think they're going to stick around for uh, for a long run because they're just like kind of like, you know, solving the current pain point. Right. I assume it'll get better. Like in theory, it should get better to figure out what did I actually mean that I wasn't able to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also think like a lot of things uh, will just um, talking about like these products, like, you know, for example, generating an avatar or something like a lot of these things are just going to move to the front end of these products. So basically, mm -hmm. like, you know, you know, instead of you having to come up with, okay, I need like, you know, golden hour photography and yeah. like, you know, I want it like to be taken by this type of lenses and whatnot in order to just fine tune exactly what you need. A lot of these things are just going to be kind of like presets that you're just going to select and kind of like, you know, get the result you want. Mm -hmm. um, and then possibly maybe, you know, knowing how much people value simplicity and speed in products and everything, um, I think you may get like, I don't know, maybe like less than 1% of people who would actually be like, no, 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 you know, give me like my, uh, uh, give, give me like a text box where I can enter on my own prompt and just kind of like, you know, fine tune it down to the level of whatever. But uh, right now, like it's also getting capped. I mean, we're talking about Dali a lot, yeah. but I also want to point out that like, even though Dali felt like magical yeah. you know, just a few months ago, now I'm actually like much more impressed with uh, mid journey and mm -hmm. stable diffusion and so forth. Yeah. Because like they feel, at, at least at the current iteration, they feel like they're, I don't know, like a few lot light years ahead of um, of Delhi. And um and what is also interesting is like because like some of these are um I, I think like a, a stable diffusion is open source so you can actually like you know spin up your own. Um we are also seeing like all sorts of solutions where you can just kind of like deploy your own cloud really for, for AI and use right. that um, instead of like you know having to ping somebody else's API and basically right. also rely on you know whether they're um whether, whether they're up as a service at the moment or not. Um, so in that sense, like it's uh, it's also fascinating that now you're getting all of all these sort of solutions which make exceedingly easy mm -hmm. to do certain things which used to be the domain of really hardcore AI ML people. Like, you know, for example, like it used to be that in order to train a model like for something like relatively complex, um, you know, a few years ago it, it could cost anywhere between like, you know, half a million to like four million dollars or more. Yes. Um, but training now, data was an asset in and of itself for a lot of companies. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And now you have things like uh, Liner.ai where you can literally like install locally on your Mac, uh, you know, like so everything you need to train like a, a machine learning model, yeah. uh, which either like, you know, recognizes things in photos or like, you know, looks for certain patterns or whatever. And then you can just like, basically once you have the model, you can just deploy that to like uh, replicate or, or one of those services, which allow you to just kind of like, you know, uh, build your own uh, AI cloud with your own proprietary model and just, you know, like use uh, use API to ping that like whenever you need it. So in that sense, it's like, uh, it's kind of like a fast changing world really yeah. because uh, I always say a lot of my friends who are AI and ML engineers, like that for years they, they would keep saying like, uh, you know, whenever I would joke with them and be like, okay, so like when are we going to see like widespread productive use of AI in the world? They would be like, oh, any day now. And they, uh, and they, they would say like, uh, that was like a common thing to say in their uh, 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 space for literally like, you know, decades. Yep. But I think we're now actually at the cusp of all of that. We're, we're literally seeing uh, people like build a lot of things. And I think 
a lot of that has to do with the democratization of the entire process because now it's just an API call away, right? Right. Which is an opportunity, but it's also a threat because like <laughs> if you're running an existing product, you have to think about, okay, so like, um, how should I say, like, if I'm, let's say I'm a PM at an organization and I'm getting pressured by uh, by my stakeholders that, you know, I need to do something with AI because yeah. of either like- What you know, is our plan for AI? Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I would like to have a giant meeting where you present me your deck on what you're going to do. Exactly. So like, you know, oh, shareholders are demanding it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, but like uh, the funny thing is like, there is, I think, a real risk for a lot of uh, incumbent products or, or existing products uh, to do it the wrong way, but yeah. by essentially just like tacking on uh, some AI features onto the existing thing, without really thinking it through how this changes everything in terms of, uh, okay, so like instead of automating like a tiny piece, maybe your entire product, which was built uh, for kind of like a manual process, maybe like the whole thing can get like completely rethought uh, through through AI. Or maybe like it's, you know, like 90% of it just goes away and kind of like, because if you don't do that, like, there are a lot of hungry startups out there which are more than willing to jump into these opportunities. And I think yeah. that's going to be like a bloodbath over the next few years. I mean, it certainly creates a mat, like, you know, one of the things that I think like you zoom out and look at some of the best VCs have always talked about is the, um, you know, what are the dynamics that shift the market that create massive opportunities? Right. And so at one point it was the transition to the cloud, obviously most famously led by Salesforce. Then you had uh, mobile, and so it was like this entirely new device and landscape that you could use things in. Um, with AI here, uh, you're absolutely right. I think if you don't you if you don't have a plan for AI at all, you need to at least think about how could AI be integrated in what we're doing. Once you do that, you have to start to say from a threat perspective, what could AI do? that would completely disrupt or replace us. Totally. Is there is there a way that this would be done 10x faster, 10x mm -hmm. cheaper, 10x easier? Um, like, like it's not always clear. I think, it, you know, I don't think your payroll provider is a, is a threat of being lost to AI, but I think that if you were, you know, a some type of like marketing automation software or something, mm -hmm. like it's entirely possible that there's a day coming where, you know, instead of setting up this complex logic, you just tell the AI, hey, I want everybody who's like Lazar who downloaded this free PDF, I want them to get a follow-up email seven days later and a follow-up email 21 days later. The seven-day email should talk about the giveaway they download and ask how it was and in a PS promote our product and the 21 day later one should be about our product. And it will literally set up all the logic for it, take a first draft of copy for you and set it all up. So all you have to do is jump in and proofread it. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that that's, exa that's exactly what you brought up with, you know, people getting like, you know, 10x in terms of productivity and, Correct. and you know, figuring out like, you know, what to do with the rest of their time to kind of go even an extra mile beyond that. Yeah. And in general, you know, just like looking at, at all of these opportunities, I, I think like a lot of things will change in in uh, in a way. Uh, as I said, like you know, one of the things I expect, like sure, you know, there's going to be a lot of centaur professions, but at the yeah. same time, I think we're going to see a resurgence of like uh, 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 things uh, professions which have to do with, with like you know physical world, mm -hmm. just because like the barrier would be much higher in those cases. Like you know, if you're a lawyer and you're used to just like editing these like boilerplate templates where you're just like you know change like name of three companies and uh, maybe like you know tweak one sentence and you charge me like you know two grand for that, yeah. and you you're getting automated away by you know like chat GPT, which I got for free to get to do the same thing like within 15 minutes with like a few iterations. Yes. In that case, like, sure, like, you know, not everybody's going to do that, right? Like, you know, um, I, I'm tech savvy enough to, to actually, like, you know, right. go down that route. But, like, um, if you're a lawyer, you may be thinking, okay, so, like, why even spend those, uh, like, 10 minutes or whatever, like, editing that thing where I could be using some sort of product which automates that for me. Right. And, and just, you know, uh, go faster with that. But at the same time, I, I think like a lot of people will get spooked away by, uh, you know, everything going on in AI and kind of like shift their attention more towards like physical spaces and yes. physical procedures and physical things. And essentially, because like, again, this is a, this is a whole other like uh, a rabbit hole, but yeah. 
you know how we often talk how like we stopped innovating in the physical space like, <laughs> and we ended up like you know everything is about like bits which is great yeah, but the software time, eating in the world yeah exactly but you know we're neglecting atoms like you know yeah. actual things like in the world and then that turns into like all sorts of like societal decays and whatnot and again you know uh, my thesis is that some of that also has to do with like uh, 1971 and you know but let's not go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole this time <laughs> yeah absolutely I, I think it's important to think about it though like I know for me I've had the same lawyer for like eight or nine years now mm -hmm. she's helped me like with Lighthouse she helped me with my consulting business I, I've referred to her to a bunch of people and the thing I realize is when I think about the value I get from her it is not documents in mm -hmm. fact one of the awesome things that she did on day one when I signed with her was she literally emailed me a packet and she's uh -huh. like, here are temp boilerplate templates for the like 10 most common documents I know you will need. That's so, so I have a boilerplate consulting engagement agreement to use for anybody we hire. Mm -hmm. I have a boilerplate NDA and like, there's just like a bunch of things. And like, she's like, yeah, just have Adam. Like, I know like there's blanks to fill in and I trust you can handle that. And um, what I realize is what that does is that her value is not in the va is not in the documents. Her value is in her consultative advice. Right. Let me let me play a devil's advocate sure. again in, in this case. So uh, let's play this hypothetical example. Sure. So let's say you have a product where essentially as a, as a founder you can go in and be like, okay, I need this sort of thing with like you know these specifics, and it just sure. like spits out the document for you. So, but again, like. That's not the most important thing. Sure. Let's say in addition to that, it also has a, a page or a section in the app or whatever where you can talk to it. So like, you know, when you're talking, uh, everything you're saying gets uh, um, transcribed in real time using like uh, some API, like, you know, Whisper 2.0 by uh, OpenAI, okay. for example. Um, you get that uh, transcript. That transcript get, uh, gets fed to uh, um, uh, GPT-3 mm -hmm. and with like, you know, some... Uh, how should you say, like uh, safety rails in terms of, okay, so like this is legal advice. So, you know, you're, you should be taking these things into account and so forth. And then basically speak all of that back to you as it gets output. So you're essentially, you, you could also have like, you know, AI legal advisor, like, of course, it's not going to cover like 100% of cases, but, you know, for like small business owners, I can easily see, uh, see that, you know, covering, I don't know, 70% of cases, even like, you know, at, at the current stage of development. Because like, you know, it's... Right, but then I think mm -hmm. my point is you still end up with the centaur where like that lawyer can have uh, literally many more clients. Mm -hmm. uh, an individual lawyer can have many more, uh, many more clients because they can offload some of the more boring work. And in addition, like, I love what you're saying, Lazar, but, you know, tell me how your doc holds up the first time it actually goes to court. Right. I realize that, like, frankly, we're lucky. We live in a trust-based society, especially in America. Totally. And so, like, you know, many of us will never actually have to go to court over a contract we signed. But if you do, you cannot tell the judge, hey, I use an AI to generate this. I meant this, <laughs> even if it says that. And the judge is going to say, this is contract law. It's what's written down. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, listen, that, that's why I said, like, you know, I reviewed my NDA, like, you know, when it was generated. It wasn't like, you know, I just, like, took the first thing that GPT-3... Uh, uh, right, but out. you also told me it lies. So, like... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so, like, so, like, there, but, but there is a risk there. Totally. But, like, not not in sense of these, how should I say, like, these mechanical things. Because if you, if you look at, like, law, law at the essence of it, like, the contract is basically just, like, how should I say, almost, like written language equivalent of code. It's just like legal code. It just like stipulates certain things like sure. between like a number of parties and kind of like, you know, how certain things are supposed to happen and so forth, yeah. which isn't that different from like, you know, like just computer code for, for you know, running software. And um, and in that sense, like there's, a, I would say like there are certain overlaps where an, an engineer's mindset would be very similar to a lawyer's mindset. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, like uh, th that's what makes it like very mechanical. I feel like um, because like all of those fuzzy cases w w which I encountered, where you know like uh, Chat GPT would lie to me or uh, not give me like a good enough answer or something, were things which weren't necessarily mechanical processes, which were more kind of like you know how should I say based around like you know society or culture or history or something like that. And for what it's worth, I I also tested it on like some uh, case law uh, history 
just like you know to to sure. see certain things and i for example like uh i mean i've been seeing seeing some of those things uh online as well i mean mark Andreessen had like a great tweet the other day about like you know uh, the government pressurizing like uh, uh pressuring uh, private companies to censor speech on their behalf like is that constitutional right. so um chat gpt was actually able to pull up like examples like from case law saying like no you know we already have like these cases in history which proved no that's not constitutional right so because you know it goes against freedom of speech right so in those terms like it's good but again like that's a how should I say it? it's very codified um, uh, body of knowledge, right? Sure. Whereas history really is more fuzzy in, in a lot of. Uh, I mean, I would argue it's not that much, but again, you know, like uh, you know, coming from the Balkans, you know that like famous uh, famous adage, you know, like one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Right. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I still stand by the fact that like you won't know that there's a problem with your. AI generated legal docs until the first time you have to enforce them. Um, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so what's interesting though, is I actually have a friend who has a startup that literally, um, uh, it's called law insider. And uh -huh. literally what it does is it's a collection of clauses mm -hmm. so that when a lawyer is generating a legal document, they can literally search for the clause they're looking for and get bo essentially get a boilerplate answer to it to help them more quickly build it in blocks. Oh, yeah, that, it, just like code, like, you, know, you know, you have a component, yes. you just like drop in a component right. and that's it. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and, but his site is essentially the centaur model. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't caught up with him in a while, so I don't know where he's at with like having AI be layered onto what he's doing. Right. But at the least, he's already built the search engine for lawyers to build those piecemeal um so i, I mean i think it, like look every job is going to have places where it ai is involved certainly you know a plumber is going to use a lot less ai although maybe he'll use it to answer the phones for him and manage his schedule uh so that all he has to do is drive from home to home to fix the pipes oh yeah you you told me about that great example about like uh what was it uh uh, a guy who created, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. So, saw this awesome story on uh, on Twitter. Uh, There's a guy who who has uh, somebody come and do his lawn care and like gardening and things like that. And he realized the person's English isn't very very uh, good. They can communicate, but like written English is just not their thing. And so um, he's like, "Watch what I had to do." He he figured out a way to take what they would say, which would be like. 3 p.m. good, uh, see you, see you outside, th you know, thanks, Jose. And like, basically like he used that uh, uh, chat GPT to exp do an automatic expander on that. So instead it would say, hi, Amy, thanks so much for confirming the time I'm gonna meet you. I will meet you outside your home at 3 p.m. All the best, Jose. And so he literally turned that into an instant thing for him where he can, uh, you know, this, this, this lawn, lawn guy can, can run this business by himself, even though his English, his written English proficiency isn't quite there yet. And so he built this system for the guy, just gave it to him. And now yeah, and you mentioned like, like uh, yeah. uh, uh, the guy very quickly after he started using that, like landed the first contract to final, like what, like 150 grand or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it's something yeah. crazy like that. But yeah, the guy was able to then immediately get a contract because it was helping him with the communication. Yeah. And so like that, that is a perfect example of like that intersection. Cause like AI isn't going to cut the lawn. I've seen, I've seen <laughs> what the robo, um, <laughs> like, um, uh, robot lawn cutters that are that are like uh, your what is the indoor disc that goes around people the Roomba. Oh, Roomba. I've yeah. seen the outdoor version of the Roomba that cuts grass and it's hilariously terrible. So I don't think that they're at risk of the robots taking their main job, but it's going to actually take something off their plate that's really annoying for them, which is managing all the communication and scheduling. So totally, and just kind of like riffing off of that, uh, yeah. I just remember like a really good example. So uh, I told you uh, about that thing, which I read. Um, there's a startup now, which actually uh, does real time augmentation of people's uh, spoken English, oh, yeah. uh, but like for call centers. So oh, like, you know, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. a call center, like uh, uh, some place overseas and yeah. not worry at, at all about like their accents or anything because yeah. they get like, you know, ironed out in real time. So yeah. what comes out on the other side is like standardized American English. So. Yeah, did you, did you see the video on Twitter that went viral the other day of the guy talking and he had Morgan Freeman uh, oh, yeah, generated yeah, 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 yeah. above him and it was taking his words and making it look like Morgan Freeman said right. that was I mean Morgan Freeman is a very distinct voice which maybe helps a little bit but it like 
that kind of stuff is getting so good that like when Donald Trump launched his his ridiculous NFTs yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Lazar, Lazar actually sent it to me and I literally was like, I I think this might be fake. <laughs> yeah. Because like I'm trying to do, like, and then like I'm looking at it, I'm trying to judge like the cadence and being like, it's kind of choppy. Like that's very, it sounds like his words, but would Trump talk like that? And of course it turns out it's real. It's real. Our former president decided the most important thing he can do in America today right now is sell some essentially glorified trading cards. JPEGs. Yeah, JPEGs. I mean, apparently they sold out and the floor is double the original Seriously? price. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah, the floor price right now is $250 on them apparently. Wow. Okay. And they sold for 99 and he had 47,000 of them. So you can do the math. He, he made like, what, 4.7 million? Not bad. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the world is upside down. Um, sucker born every minute, whatever phrase you'd like oh, to yeah. use. But like- that's how good things are getting that like I saw the Morgan Freeman thing and I was like, wow, this is incredible. They're like Lazar said, they're going to, uh, you know, changing people's voices in real time. Yep. And, uh, you know, in this case I saw something that was real and I actually was betting. I think I told you I was like 60% thinking it was fake. Yeah. 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 yeah so like I knew there was room for it to be real, <laughs> but like I thought I had seen enough that I, it just had to be it had to be fake. Yeah, we're entering a very interesting world in that sense. I mean, like uh, I also read the other day that like, uh, and now China mandates for like any sort of like AI touched uh, up video to actually have like a, a disclaimer that yeah. it was like AI generated. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I can imagine like all sorts of uh, ways where their society could get like, you know, shaken up really well oh, uh, <laughs> with some of those. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, especially you think about the old uh, October surprise of politics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, can you imagine, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a PG one I could do, but just like, you imagine the, the a scandal of like pretending mm -hmm. that a, a candidate said something, mm -hmm. releasing a video, everyone goes crazy about it. And then a week later, we find out it was fake. But if a week later is election day, it one might be worth it. Um, and two could do, you know, tremendous damage misleading people. And the better this gets, the harder it's going to be to, to tell that no, Lazar did not actually say that. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's going to become like a really big problem, like in politics, like in general, yeah. like globally. Right. Uh, you know, back in in the in the ages when you know I, I still lived in Serbia, like yeah. uh, I um, I attended a course which was taught by a former president of Serbia at the time, and he said uh, something that he said like really stuck with me uh, over the years, which when he basically said that like uh, oh you know like um, uh, the hardest thing to fight are these like false claims because like you know if somebody accuses you of something um, and they make like a big fuss about it and it goes like all over the media and everything yeah. like even if it's not true and you have like proofs it's not true. Um, it's literally the equivalent, like, you know, put it in American terms, like, you know, climbing to the top of like the Empire State Building or something and kind of like, you know, emptying out like an entire feathers worth, uh, pillows worth of feathers and they fly like in all, all sorts, of, sorts of direction. Yeah, pick them all up. Yeah, yeah. And you, then you have to collect all of that. Right. And it's, and now with deep fakes, it's just becoming like, you know, even crazier because it's yeah. like, no, no, no. It's not that I heard that some somebody did something. I actually saw it with my own eyes. Right. And, you know, you know how that goes with a lot of people, right? Oh, absolutely. And even like Twitter, like there are times where I feel like Twitter is great because if you go to like what's happening now and you want to see like a protest in Cuba or Brazil or something right. like that, like right now it, it can be great to see that. But in the future, you can potentially run into it being like, oh, either that didn't happen or mm -hmm. this is like altered footage of something that happened, you know, 10 years ago or, or, or a year ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but let's let's take this, uh, let's spin it into like a more positive direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So what I'm looking forward to a lot yeah. is that I think in two to four years, Hollywood is done. Oh, because yeah. like, you know, once you have like generative AI in video, get to the level where it's that good. Yeah. Basically like any kid living, uh, uh, you know, in mom and dad's basement would be able to like, you know, bring to the market, like, you know, the next uh, big blockbuster. So I think we're going to yeah. be seeing like, you know, these like new dedicated platforms where they would be just hosting like, you know, these kind of like, you know, uh, independent independently made like movies, which sure. are not like made on indie budget of like, you know, basically, you know, like peanuts, but rather like looking like, you know, with all the things that you would expect in something which costs like 300, 400 million dollars or more. Yeah. Um, because it just like the barriers are dropping very uh, fast. And you mentioned the thing with like uh, uh, AI generated like 3D assets. Yeah. 
right now it's like um, everything I've seen so far is just like individual assets. So you're telling it, for example, like, you know, I need a 3D model of um, a fortress tower or something, or, yeah. you know, I need a 3D model of a horse. But once you can actually take that like a step further and, and be like, okay, I need a scene of like, you know, a mass battle of between like, you know, 50,000 people. Yeah. Well, there you go. You're building your own Lord of the Rings or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things that uh, is interesting is I know uh, a number of film studios part of the clause often of doing a movie with them is mm -hmm. that they get to scan your likeness. Mm. And so like, uh, if you're a fan of the Fast and Furious series, you know, Paul Walker tragically yeah. died between one of the films. And so what they actually did is they had his brother stand in for him in a number mm -hmm. of scenes and they literally used an early version of AI to put Paul Walker's face right. on it. And then they used audio from earlier, um, earlier films to use his voice again. And so like, that was a bit of a hack because that was a couple of years ago. But, you know, I think Hollywood is at least thinking of it a little bit and thinking if they can own those assets because in theory, like, wouldn't it be amazing if like you could bring back like John Wayne and and Audrey Hepburn and things, things oh, yeah, like that totally. and like make iconic films that would have been physically impossible because-, because Different eras and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah different yeah, totally. eras and things like that. So there's a lot of interesting things that come there, but you're, you're right. There's, there's an interesting question of like, for them, like where is the centaur for them or where is the things that like, no, we're not going to film that way. Or does it become kind of like, um, uh, you know, classic muscle cars, like, you know, a handful of people will own their like 69 Mustang or something like that. But and so some people will be purists who want to watch 35 millimeter film that was filmed in real life, right. but like most things won't. Like most things will be more like Avatar, where it's like all completely generated. Yeah, and also you know just talking about like completely generated things. Like yeah. uh, once you can generate something like that, you can also generate something which doesn't look generated at all. Right. Like you know you want like you know a classic noir film from like the 30s. Yeah. You know, you got it. Oh uh, yeah! Imagine imagine Seinfeld fan fiction brought in, yeah. brought in the present, <laughs> like present day Seinfeld in apartment. Uh, uh, Kramer walks in and complains about the chat GPT responses that he got this morning, asking it about how to make the perfect falafel. Like I don't know, like yeah, like you can just you can just see where people would probably want to start doing stuff like that. that. That's also an interesting topic because I think like with a lot of IP out there in terms of uh, uh, entertainment brands, like yeah. I wonder like who's gonna be the first to the market to actually kind of like uh, lease that out for these use cases. Like, you know, you right. want Seinfeld or you want like, you know, whatever else, like, yeah. you know, sure, you know, just go in there and it's but already it's gonna cost you, but it's of gonna cost of you. Of course, that's how it yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so that's the interesting thing then I think in, in that kind of world, and I, I think even going back to your basic graphical uh -huh. designers who are pulling back from their material being used in design mm -hmm. is you have that interesting question of like, what is IP ownership mm -hmm. in that world? Yeah. Um, and does it actually, you know, I constantly have to get my phone number taken off of these, um, you know, sales- uh, Robocallers? Yes, yeah, sales yeah. robocaller lists all the time. Every time a new one pops up, like if I accidentally answer the phone, I'm like, what tool are you using? <laughs> Come on, just tell me the name of the tool so I can get on the do not call list. And then you have submitting and of course they drag their feet for 30 days so that they can really sell your number out. Oh, you're not collecting money off of that? Uh, what? Uh, I mean, uh, I, I I heard of a guy who actually figured that like whenever you get an unwanted call, like uh, uh, you can get a, I I don't remember like twenty four hundred off of that or something. So he actually like cherishes the opportunity to get as many uh, of these as possible I, because he was pulling in like sixty k a year or something. Uh, like that. I am apparently leaving a lot of money on the table <laughs> because same here I, by the way. I yeah. <laughs> I I am getting getting apparently thousands of dollars in calls every week. Um, no, but it'll be interesting to see then uh, how you think about like IP and assets and things like that. Cause uh -huh. like for instance, Disney has built their entire empire over the last 10 to 15 years oh, yeah. around owning tons of IP, which means that they, you know, they own all these well-known valuable characters. Mm -hmm. And while well, they've done a great job in my opinion of, of, of blowing a lot of them, totally agree. um, those are still assets where like, do you let them in? You know, how much would you charge somebody to do a fan fiction Star Wars All right. uh, that's actually allowed to generate it? Or is there a big business in another AI being trained just to enforce it? Or just creating entirely new uh, um, IP families. Like, yeah. sure. for example, like uh, a thing which comes to mind is if, you know, like uh, I shouldn't say if, I should say like when we get like the first completely AI generated like blockbuster in a few years. Yeah. And it becomes like, you know, um, think of it this way. Like Disney has like a lot of these like brands which have like, you know, decades of history, which makes them valuable and yeah. all that. Um, even though they're driving into the ground for a lot of those. Yeah. Um, 
But at the same time, like some of the more recent ones, uh, you know, ever since they picked up Pixar, yeah. Pixar didn't have like, you know, decades of, uh, of backstory no, they had to there. No, with new material. Yeah, totally. So, you know, and if you look at like Pixar animations, they're, you know, like 3D movies, right? So technically once you can do that, like using AI, um, you could also spin up like all sorts of interesting things. And also because it would be relatively easy compared to like, you know, hundreds of millions of budget necessary to do like a regular 3D movie, um, you could also kind of like, you know, almost A-B test like different things. Like, okay, so like this combination was super popular, but this combination wasn't. Like, you know, people don't like the supporting character. Let's try like three others. Mm -hmm. And so just like, dropping that um, barrier to entry in terms of uh, uh, the cost could drive a lot of uh, kind of like fine tuning to optimize for like, you know, future popular brands or something. Yeah, so that actually brings up a good question. I've seen uh, Sam Altman from mm -hmm. the OpenAI organization talk about the insane amount of money that it's costing. Yeah, actually. a million a day or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think they, I think it was like the first week it came out, it was $3 million a day. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, knowing that, how, how do we look at the cost of AI? So you have all these startups and stuff that'll want to, mm -hmm. uh, and, and businesses that will want to integrate AI, but mm -hmm. like, I, I, I don't know how much it is just, there's that many people pounding on it, but, but how do we think about the cost here? You know, is this going to be like Bitcoin where like Bitcoin needed essentially new, uh, kinds of, uh, uh, chips developed just for that purpose? Uh, do we need the same thing for AI or like is cost actually going to slow down some of some of the potential of this? Right. So I don't think it's slowing down. It's because it's, it's so, uh, you know, as we discussed, like everybody, you know, especially like, you know, corporate media these days is telling yeah. you, oh, you know, like tech is having like a really bad day, all the layoffs at like big sure. tech companies and all, 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 all of these things. But with AI, with the AI tidal wave coming in, I think like, you know, within like six to 18 months, we're going to literally... Uh, get to the beginning of like an insane uh, reinvention of like literally like every industry out there. Yeah. And um, so kind of like feeding into that, like uh, I would be very surprised not to see like hardware manufacturers start shipping uh, uh, more um, chips uh, uh, which are specialized, like, you know, just in processing some of these things, just like yeah. you brought up like ASICs for, for Bitcoin mining. Yeah. Like, you know, before that, like, you know, I'm, old enough to remember the days when you could, you know, just like uh, casually mine Bitcoin, just, you know, using your laptop and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and all that. But like now it's not possible because you have like these like massive like data centers, yeah. literally like, you know, hangers worth of like, you know, three stories of ASICs lined up with like liquid cooling and what, we're literally talking about, you know, right. tens of millions of dollars in hardware. So um I don't know, like maybe we get like specialized data centers with just specialized, like, you know, in making like AI faster or whatever. I, I don't know, like, uh, again, we're also using this like catch all uh, phrase, like AI, which is pretty big field with like different things. It's not like, it's not like everything is like the same model and all that. So, um, so yeah, um, I would expect hardware manufacturers to step up and actually like provide like more processing power for, for these use cases. And I also think like you can see like some early, um, early signs of that. So um, I didn't follow that like very closely, but uh, I, I've uh, heard recently that like uh, Apple is now like making some of uh, uh, ML things like faster, machine learning things faster in in, uh, in new Macs. So you can see that they're at least kind of like, you know, expecting that to definitely become a big thing. Because if you look at Apple as an organization, everybody likes telling, you know, how they are like super innovative and all that. But they're actually like most, in most of the cases, they're just like actually playing it very safe, you know. Cal uh, calculated risks but where risk is like actually very low because you already right. see something happening yeah. and then you come out with like more polished solution I mean I don't want to go to like too far in, in history of tech but like you, you know even uh, you know the iPod like when it came out like it wasn't anything new or revolutionary like mp3 players had been around for for a while at that point and mm -hmm. there had been some which have been like way better than like anything that uh, iPod was uh, I was very impartial to like creatives um, products and I love them um, and they could do more than, uh, you know, my friend's uh, iPod could do. But at the same time, Apple won because, like, they identified, like, what the important parts are. Like, you know, not everybody wanted to watch, like, you know, DVX movies, like, uh, on a small screen on their player, like I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, like, everybody wanted to listen to music. So they just, like, you know, it kept iterating on that part until right. they got it to a level where your average consumer felt like, you know, great about their product. And I think like a lot of that, that thinking like plays into a lot of other things they do. So for example, like, you know, um, 
I'm willing to bet that the only reason why we haven't seen um, uh, Apple AR glasses yet is because they haven't got it to a point where like your average consumer can accept them mm-hmm. uh, and not repeat like the same uh, mistake that like Google did with uh, like uh, Google glasses, right? Yeah, yeah, Google Glass, yeah. So, so yeah, um, the, it's very encouraging that you see them getting into like the entire like. Uh, okay, so our hardware is going to be optimized for uh, for ML and AI. So Lazar, we, we've talked a lot about uh, a wide range of topics on how AI is going to change a lot of things we do in the world. Let, let's bring this back to practical product and let's talk about what specifically is the things that a product manager can do. So so whether it's the executive coming and saying, what's our plan for AI and present me something next week? Or it's you bottoms up thinking like, how can my business be disrupted by it? Or maybe someone's thinking about starting their own thing. How how can we think about as product managers how AI should be involved without feeling like we're just like throwing buzzwords onto the end of a, of a startup? Right, so I, I would say um, the first question that I would ask myself as a PM would be uh, what, like what can AI address which would feel literally like magical to my users? Not in any like buzzwordy way, but literally yeah. like just kind of like what heavy lifting I can take off of their plate using this new technology mm-hmm. and essentially uh, start there and start start rethinking your product strategy based on that. At least like, you know, for maybe like a part of a product, in some cases it may be like much more. So, so thinking about it that way then like would... You know, let's say you're a PM at like a, a medium-sized company, so you've got mm-hmm. you've got a few pods, and you're in charge of this one like one product. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> How would you think about like the difference between like, hey, we need a Skunk Works team, and we're just gonna like have them start something from scratch that's AI, versus like, hey, can we essentially you know iframe Chat J- J- GPT or something like that, and like this is somehow a value add to what we're doing? How how would you how would you think about like trying to evaluate whether it's like, oh, we need to start from scratch and just build something on the side, and it's like augmenting the rest of our product versus like bringing it into an existing product, and it's just you know whether we're displaying the prompt responses in us or something like that. Like how, how would you think about kind of skunk works versus integration? Right. Um, obviously this is going to be, you know, case by case, yeah. depending on like, you know, the specifics of uh, what you're doing. But generally speaking, like I would err more on the side uh, of integration mm-hmm. just because like a lot of these things that we talked about today uh, are now accessible through just like regular APIs, which uh, which has lowered dramatically this, um, um, or I should say like dropped uh, this barrier to entry uh, to the whole thing because you don't need like uh, special, in most cases for a lot of things that we talked about, you don't really even need like a, a dedicated like uh, AI ML engineers, which do come with like a cost premium, right? Yes. Uh, you can just like get like a regular web developer who understands, you know, like, again, like the very basics, you know, how to ping an API and do something with a response. Um and just like use some of the of the shelf things. So, for example, like you know, we talked about uh, uh, transcribing a speech in real time. You know, yes. you, you can l- use like Whisper t- uh, 2.0 for that. Mm-hmm. Or you know, like you need like uh, uh, you have you have some sort of text input and you want some some text output out of it. You can use GPT three. Um, you or if you don't want to pay anything to uh, to open AI, you can use what is called like GPTJ, which is like you know uh, basically like a free source model. Uh, sorry, uh, open source model for uh, for the same thing or very comparable uh, to the latest uh, Da Vinci model uh, that OpenAI has. Um, and then oh, and then of course you can deploy that on your own infrastructure, so you're not paying like for um, for API calls, even though like just in DevOps that may kind of like you know be about the same price, like, you know, when you account for uh, maintaining your own infrastructure. But um, other than that, like there there are a lot of these uh, ways where essentially you can take existing uh, uh, technologies Mm -hmm. and not have to develop anything from scratch because like the existing things are already good enough to actually like make, uh, you know, not just like move the needle a little bit, but like completely... uh, 
um, allow you to change, you know, something that you're working on and just kind of like step in and uh, because like a lot of these things are very open, open-ended, right? Right. Like people are playing with chat GPT, asking it like, you know, weird questions and whatnot and, you know, have it write jokes and like, you know, ditties and whatnot. But like at the end yeah. of the day, like you can also use it for things where uh, previously you would have to run like certain calculations or something. Yeah. You can now give it like, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, human speech version of, hey, you know, like I have like these things and then you just like, you know, uh, populate that with like some dynamic values out of either your database or whatever. And then essentially that builds the prompt and then you also tell it like what sort of output you want to get. Is it like, you know, JSON, like, you know, the file yeah. or something else and essentially just like parse uh, uh, the data you get back. So it's, again, highly case by case depending on what you need. But I would say like generally speaking for probably like 90% of businesses out there talking about like digital products, um, off the shelf solutions are definitely a way to go at, at this stage. They're definitely good enough to support uh, most of these use cases. Absolutely, and I think another thing that's underrated that can be done is thinking about how AI can make your company more effective. Mm -hmm. So before you even necessarily jump on and be like, oh, we're hey, I want a $5 million budget, 10 engineers, a PM, a designer, and a marketer, and like we're gonna go and like build this crazy AI thing, and that's gonna be like a new initiative for our business. Right. Rather than doing that, I think the other thing you can look at is say, how can we make our internal work better? Mm -hmm. So like, hey, marketing team, start using the copywriting tool. Hey, engineers, start using the uh, the new GitHub Copilot. Uh, Copilot, yeah. Yeah, start using Copilot to help make you more efficient and ask ChatGPT to help whenever Stack Overflow isn't good enough on its own. Totally. Um, and and what, what I think is interesting about those enhancements is if you get people in your company to start using AI for their work, mm -hmm. that will make everyone on your team more familiar with the potential of AI which then I think will lead to better ideas on how to apply AI to your business uh, for your customers, as opposed to feeling like you're just trying to like latch on something right away. Maybe if you do see something that's easy and obvious, then do it. But if you're not sure, rather than trying to force it, get the rest of your company and team using uh, AI in their own jobs. And that may help them start to think about how maybe, wait, what if we did X? Like, I can't tell you how many times the best ideas I've ever gotten from engineers that I work with as a PM, the best ideas I got from them are usually from like side projects, other things they've done in the past and things where they're just looking at the adjacent possible and they go and they say, oh, you know what? We did this thing for this thing that was that thing that is completely different than this. But this one little nugget, this one little element can be brought into what we're doing and it'll make it way better. And, and you it just go like, clicks. Yeah, it just yeah. clicks and you're like, oh, that's so good. That'll be so much better than just slapping AI on just for the sake of it. Um, and that that comes up from making everybody familiar. And so, you know, especially if one of your executives comes to you and is like bottom or sorry, top down telling you, hey, what's our plan for AI? Like one of the things to do is to immediately look and say, hey, how can people on my team or maybe even, uh, you know, that boss person uh, get their first touch with it before they start forcing it into our product? Absolutely. Um, the that goes back to to what we discussed discussed about like you know not tacking on things just for the sake of it but mm -hmm. rather like having like you know deep uh, kind of like a deeper um session of thinking or whatever you want to call it like yeah. uh, uh, about the session, uh, essentially like figuring out like where uh new companies or new products could disrupt you yeah unless you rethink some of the things which used to be manual in your product which now could possibly be automated away uh um, and just like empower your users to uh, to do more or be faster or whatever it is, and essentially take some of the heavy lifting off of their plate. So it's it's very value based. Like at the end of the day, right? It's just like you know you don't want to uh, have you know like for example like uh, a friend of mine uh, mentioned the other day uh, after having played with uh, Chat GPT. Uh, He's like non-technical, but he's he's also a serial founder. He has like a, a few very uh, successful SaaS businesses uh, that he runs. And he was like, oh man, I, I'm so ready for uh, chat GPT uh, um, in inside Slack. And I asked him, okay, so like, but what specifically? He's yeah. like, oh, I don't know really, but like, you know, uh, that, that looks great. I actually want like HR inside of Slack running off of GPT-3. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. But, uh, you know, 
Give there have been a lot more. of, I know multiple startups, including uh, one of the investors in Lighthouse uh -huh. who, who, who have spent a lot of time trying to do that. And that turns out to be one of the more difficult problems. Yeah, because it's like, you know, fuzzy culture-based thing and it's not like yes. technical. Like, uh, uh, so with technical, it's really easy because like, uh, so I mentioned Bubble earlier and yes. oh, you know, I'm a big proponent. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is like, there's this like, uh, um, refactoring effort that they've been running on their code base for like, you know, months now. And they're still like, you know, either like in low uh, uh, double digits or like, you know, maybe even like lower, yeah. uh, just like with the whole process. And then I see on Twitter the other day, the guy who just like, you know, fed like an entire uh, code base of something like uh, in, uh, in GPT-3 and gets like uh, everything refactored literally, you know, within a minute or something. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, that's like, that that's empowering uh, develop uh, their development team, like you know the same yes. way um, as you said, like uh, make that filter throughout the organization so people see what's possible, yeah, and uh, make sure that like you know they start using these tools so they can also uh, start applying some of that towards your own product and right. just kind of like and not get like any pushback in in terms of you know like if you as a PM come to uh, come to the dev team and you're like oh you know we're going to be adding these things and people start thinking you oh, know you know you're automating me away or something like that like yeah. you, you're going to get a lot of like cultural pushback internally Correct. but if they're already benefiting from the whole thing either through like copilot or whatever else yeah. like they understand like at the end of the day like every product every digital product in the world will have like some sort of uh, ai powered component inside like yes. no matter what it is uh but just that kind of like, you know, that magical bit. So the the key thing is for teams to to be accepting of AI, not just kind of like, you know, push it aside because, you know, somebody's scared for their jobs or something. Yeah, and I think the other thing I really want to emphasize because it's a huge part of practical product and all the things I blog about mm -hmm. is nothing we've talked about today has anything to do with validation. Oh yeah, like sure. Like you can do the coolest things in the world with AI and you still could build a nice to have. You have still have to solve a very important problem for people because in the end, people don't care how you solve the problem. They care that you did solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so especially I think the risk with things like AI is it's a shiny object and you can go and add a bunch of those things, but that doesn't mean that that actually, actually adds any value to your customers. They won't necessarily be like, yeah, I'll pay you way more money for that. It's like, no, nah, that's kind of cool, but like, I don't know when I'm going to use it. Yeah, go go goes back to that like, kind of like bread and butter of every PM, which is talk to your customers. Correct, correct. AI, I don't think, AI is not going to replace talking to your customers, at least in the in the short term. Totally. Um, and so understanding users is still going to be your bread and butter. Um, you know, if you're a PM that doesn't do that, this may be the time to start brushing up on it uh, because it's going to be very important because you don't want to add AI and then add it in a way that's not actually useful to people because that's just going to be a lot of wasted resources. Um, whenever what you really want to do is understand what are your people trying to accomplish and help them do that better. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Um, how do you think, like, how do you think this might change business models? Like, like adding AI does add a cost mm -hmm. and there are other things that you could do that would be write the code once and it executes and you don't really have a whole lot of, um, you know, your own variable costs change. Mm -hmm. But with AI, at least as it is until maybe we have uh, better dedicated machines for this right. so that when you spin up a box on AWS or DigitalOcean, you're actually, uh, you know, able to be like, hey, this is going to be an AI box and it's optimized for that. Like as long as AI is still somewhat costly um how how do you think that might influence what people are, are are doing i guess they have to either put ai on a premium plan to help cover the cost or somehow be like well it's this but if you use the ai feature it's metered like do you think that like is ai going to force a lot of things to become metered products so i actually have uh, again a very contrarian take on that yeah which is I think in the short term, a lot of that is just gonna be paved over by VCs. Okay, like, you know, <laughs> subsidized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, because they're just gonna be like, okay, we wanna dominate this market, so they're yeah. just gonna pour in like you know whatever amount of money needed to make that like, and hopefully you know hydro manufacturers catch up uh, in the meantime, and then yeah. we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, like um, one of the things which I find found like uh, mind blowing is like. Um, 
somebody talked about that uh, recently where they basically said like Jasper, so like the copywriting yeah. software worth $1.5 billion at uh, the la latest valuation, um, how they basically uh, are making X amount of money like every month uh, as compared to OpenAI uh, um, upon uh, whose uh, right. GPT-3 they're running, <laughs> uh, who is making just like a fraction of that or something like right. that. And then... Um, Again, like, you know, it, it's a really good question because like one of the things with OpenAI, it's it's not a company. Like very few people understand that. It's actually a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So sure, you know, they are charging you for like the lead credits or like, you know, a um, certain number of uh, tokens which you execute uh, through their API uh, with GPT-3 and other models they have. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, you know, is that sustainable to them? I know, only Sam Altman knows, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly... As I understand it, though, if you start to use it for your business, you are you do have to pay that. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so you do get like a, a little bit free, just you know, to kind of like understand how it works. But then, yeah, but yeah. that's I mean, honestly, from what I've seen in mm -hmm. the experiments that I've done with uh, me and my business partner in Lighthouse, like uh, those are basically staging credits. Like you, you, the, you would never be able to actually surface the free credits to customers. It's just enough for you to not have to pay pay crazy amounts of money just to even say hello, world. Um, maybe it's like that now, but I yeah. know like when I first tried GPT-3, I don't know, like about a year, year and a half or two years ago, something yeah. like that. Uh, I actually, uh, had a lot of fun with like my initial credits. Yeah. So at one point, like I was, uh, uh, you've seen that story about the guy who created like an entire, ch uh, children's book, uh, uh, which you know he launched on Amazon and yeah, had like yeah. AI do the illustrations and also like uh, uh, um, GPT three like write the entire book and all that. Yeah. So I actually tried something that like that, but I couldn't get it like to uh, to do what I exactly wanted because it would take these like weird detours into almost lo Lovecraftian horror. <laughs> be like you know oh yeah, we're yeah. talking about this like you know happy little fox you know doing this thing and then suddenly it uh, approaches the pond and there are tentacles coming out. Yeah. Point, like <laughs> WTF right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Um, so I I got like a lot of drafts out of uh, out of uh, my worth of credits like initially for that, <laughs> and I also got to play around with like a bunch of other examples before I depleted all of that and had to switch to a paid plan. So in in that sense, like I I, I guess you know like your mileage may vary depending on like you know what you exactly want to do. Yeah. I all of these things like uh, initially like the initial uh, amount of credits was just through their playground i didn't even like you know write like uh, any api calls or anything that came later so cool well that makes sense and, and again going just going back and kind of re-emphasizing like mm -hmm. ai is not going to save your company like if your startup yep. doesn't have product market fit adding ai on top maybe it gets you a, another round of investors excited and willing to take a shot but like with product market fit with your customers they do not care if it's ai or or something more rudimentary that solves the problem they care about is is the problem solved and how well is it solved and how quickly is it solved so so just remember that anything you want to layer on with that uh that involves ai it it is likely to have the potential to be an excellent solution for you and do it in a transformative way but it doesn't guarantee you product market fit absolutely um Thinking about somebody who's maybe listening to this and like has a list of like 37 things they realize they now need to look at because they're not as up on this as you and I are. Um, where do you recommend people go to start to learn about AI and catch up on this and start to see what is exciting people in some of these examples? Like, how the heck did we find all these? Uh, I'm going to tell people at first uh, that Twitter is a great place to start. Um, and, and so definitely start there, but I'm curious, Lazar, if you have some places you recommend people look or accounts on Twitter you recommend they follow that will help them maybe play catch up if they feel like mm -hmm. they're, they're realizing after this conversation that they're behind on a, on a growing tidal wave heading to shore. Yeah, so I would definitely second the Twitter uh, as a great place to learn about a lot of these things that just kind of like, you know, uh, uh, at a phenomenal level in terms yeah. of just, you know, what's going on and see like some of the examples, uh, especially like for generative video, like there, there have been like a bunch of things like posted, which are really cool. Yep. Um, and then in terms of other things, uh, there, there, there have been like an... Um, there has been a, a nice number of like uh, newsletters dealing with generative AI as well. Uh, so I'm gonna plug a friend's uh, uh, newsletter here. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, called Lore. Uh, I think it's lore.com. So he has like really good uh, uh, newsletter on um, on generative AI. 
And another thing about it's uh, L O R E dot com. So it is as simple as you thought. Correct. Um, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Okay, awesome. And and I would say like you know if you haven't played with AI at all so far, just go to Chat GPT and you know start. I, I would say that's probably like the lowest possible uh, yes. hanging fruit that you can do. Just like to fill it out and see like you know what the whole thing looks like and so forth. Um, it's optimized for chat, but yeah. at the same time, like you can also ask it to output in different forms. So you know you can ask it to kind of like return some code to you, mm -hmm. and or even like uh, um, some code which is formatted in a certain way that you need or something. Yeah, just you know play around with that, see like what comes out, and uh, explore some of your interest and your uh, thing, uh, your affinities, like you know in there. Yes, because it's it's the best way to get your hands dirty, like initially, just yes. like to get a feeling of what you uh, what you can do with AI, and then after. After that, you know, you're ready for the um, deeper part of the pool. Yeah, and I think the cool thing about if you start with ChatGPT in particular is it's probably the most user friendly of the ones I've seen. So, oh, yeah. like, I tried doing a bunch. We talked earlier. I could, I had a hard time getting images to generate what I wanted. There's a little bit more of a learning curve there. That's but, Dali, right? Uh, uh, it was Dali, and uh, I tried one of their uh, Clip Drop. I also tried. Yeah, um, and so that one. yeah, so Dali and Clip Drop were. Um, surprisingly difficult to get positive results. Um, but it was still interesting to see what it did generate. And some of my attempts to edit it uh, and command it uh, were interesting. The thing I would say is that ChatGPT is much more approachable. I was immediately able to get interesting answers. I was able to figure out how to take an answer that I thought was partially what I wanted and tweak it a lot, a lot mm -hmm. easier. Um, and so I think if you're like me and you're comfortable with uh, writing like Google search queries uh, and really getting what you want there, I think you'll probably have similar success. But I'd also say that I've seen people um, have it write scripts for them with like dialogue. Um, I've had the uh, people successfully have it write like limericks and poems and rap lyrics. And stuff. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like somebody did something where it was like rap about AI using Snoop Dogg to teach like first graders about it, yeah. and it, like actually that had some izzle drizzles and, and it rhymed <laughs> and it was actually per surprisingly impressive. In addition to doing code, in addition to, you know, uh, actually I'll link to it. Uh, my company Lighthouse, we asked it leadership questions and mm -hmm. tried to grade it on how it did. You had a great blog post about it. Yeah. And so, I mean, it ranged from like, A, like, wow, this is literally like, I asked it how you could have a uh, one, what the most important things to do and having a one-on-one -on -one with your direct report. And the answer was as good as I could have gave. And then other things, like I asked it for book recommendations and it was kind of crappy because it's not really trained on that. And so it, 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 take an area or field where you're knowledgeable and try it out. Lazar did some European history and learned some things. Like just seeing what it can and can't do is, is uh, I think a great first step in understanding the power of AI because you'll start to understand that like, okay, it's good at some things, it's not good at others. And then challenge yourself. I think one of the most important skills to have as a product manager is self-awareness. And so challenge yourself as you're doing it to think like a user. So it's like, wait, go back and look at your last five queries. How did you word them? Did that affect it? Can you change the wording? Like one of my favorite things to do is I tried some very controversial topics. In fact, some of them were controversial. I'm not even going to say them here on the podcast. <laughs> but I started asking um, asking it questions about things where I feel very confident I know what the what is correct. Mm -hmm. But we live in a world right now where those things, there are potentially two answers to every question. And so it depends on, we'll say, what team you're on, what your answer would be. And I found that the word choice used in asking the question actually led to different answers. So if you ask the question like you were on team A, say, about COVID, and, and then you ask the same question and you were on team B and it was about COVID, your wording had as much to do with the answer um, as what it would say. Like, you didn't get the same answer when you ask the same question two different ways. Mm. And so I find that very fascinating and interesting. And it leads us to a world where it continues to ask that question of, you know, are we all in a bubble? Do we end up having very much self-reinforcing experiences? And does AI potentially even reinforce it? Yeah, that that's also another topic, which is probably like beyond uh, this episode. Yeah. Uh, uh, but just kind of like, you know, uh, built-in biases in AI. Right? Yes. Like, because we're, ta we're hurtling towards a world where, a lot of things are going to be AI powered, yeah. And basically, it ends up, you know, whoever controls, like, you know, what AI thinks, or yeah. you know, like how it uh, approaches like certain topics and all that, essentially controls like most of the economy in a way. So it's yeah. it's kind of like taking uh, big tech censorship to an entirely new level, which is yeah. to, to make it even scarier, kind of like you know, completely automated and enforced not by humans, but actually kind of like you know by 
uh, um, the underlying algorithms. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you already see that where I have certainly seen people that have shown that like ChatGPT, mm -hmm. not surprisingly, and I honestly, I believe it probably isn't or wasn't necessarily on purpose, mm -hmm. but the politics of ChatGPT are very similar to what I would expect a team of 100 Silicon Valley engineers who all probably have very similar beliefs on, on the spectrum. Um, you see that come through in some of the answers where you're like, you know, I'm not even sure necessarily, like, I don't think they sat down and said, we're going to hard code the AI in this area. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that happened at all. Instead, what you realize is if you start to think about the material they would train it on, the tr the material they would not train it on, right. and, and their own biases and how they might think about certain things that they would work on and tune, you start to realize that they are just like parents influence their children, uh, both intentionally and unintentionally, the parents of AI are going to influence it as well. And so um, that's another reason I think it behooves all of us, uh, regardless of whether you're a product manager uh, in the Midwest working in a really old, old clunky product, or you're working on the most cutting edge stuff somewhere in uh, one of the big tech hubs. It behooves all of us to understand AI and think about how to integrate it because at this stage, it's still very early. So it's easy to course correct. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, five, 10 years from now, a lot of things are going to be set in stone. And so uh, if only one very narrow type of person works on these and gets their fingerprints on the early stages of AI, I think it, five years from now will be much harder to course correct than if we're all kind of getting involved in it, raising concerns, asking good questions and, and totally. noticing, noticing gaps and things like that. Totally. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Uh, Lazar, is there anything else AI related that we did not talk about yet that we should? Mm. I think we covered a lot of things. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it, uh, actually, I, I would like to add one thing. Sure. So, uh, you know, how, uh, when we had that chat about kind of like uh, about that Google engineer who uh, claimed that AI uh, uh, has accomplished uh, sentience? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he got like promptly fired. Yes. He described the AI as a sweet kid. Yeah, yeah. Thing. I think that's like an inter another interesting rabbit hole. Maybe not for for this episode, but just something yeah. to leave people uh, to think about. Yeah. Like, you know, what is the point when that like really happens, and how would we even know? Because you know you're interacting with it almost as if it was a sentient creature, right? Yeah. Right now, but at the same time, like it's not. It's just like you know a bunch of uh, weight, weighted uh, yeah. things in the in the neural network. But uh, if it were to become sentient, like you know, how would we even know? Yes, that is a very good question. And honestly, one of my biggest concerns with with AI is that we turn it into a sociopath. Mm. And so the thing you need to know about sociopaths is that they will they will lie to your face and say whatever they think they need to hear to get an outcome they want without any feeling of any consequences or downsides. And so for humans, because we have been built to be tribal and want to, mm. or to want to relate to each other, not want to betray each other, for the vast majority of us, you know, it, I should believe everything Lazar says because Lazar's my friend and I trust him. Yeah. But if 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 Lazar, yeah, yes, <laughs> and so, but if Lazar, if Lazar was a sociopath, and I can tell you, audience, he's not. <laughs> but if he was, at any moment, you know, he could he could turn and completely screw me over and completely backstab me. And our entire society has evolved to one: if Lazar did that, be punished severely, um, and and two, like I because so few people are like that, it's better for me to give the benefit of the doubt and trust most people than it is to be on guard for that. But the problem with an AI potentially is that they will always just wanna please whoever they're talking to, but they don't have the same social consequences that, that, that any of us would have. You know, Lazar wouldn't be a guest again on my podcast if he betrayed me, you know? And, totally. like, and, and like he would have uh, reputational repercussions, but would an AI have those same repercussions? I'm not sure. In fact, they may even be incentivized to behave like a sociopath. So it's like they would then want to help echo chamber everybody individually to what they think that person wants while making it so then Lazar's experience with AI is very different than my experience with mm -hmm. AI because what will most please and satisfy Lazar is different than me. And so you end up having uh, this duplicitous nature of AI, which could be, could be dangerous. Totally. And uh, another scary moment about that is just like thinking, okay, so like if something like that were to happen and that entity or whatever had yeah. access to just like open internet, yeah, 
Turns out, you know, like you, can, you can get a lot of information about people like uh, uh, out there, and uh, the next step could possibly be uh, just like you said, like you know, very different experiences where it's essentially driving uh, the outcomes of your behavior by telling you certain things, kind of like you know, grooming certain thoughts in you, like yeah. over time, like you know, as you engage with it. Yes. Um, especially if it becomes like some sort of, uh, you know, a, a assistant, like you know, like uh, Siri has been trying to become, like you know, right. uh, I mean, not, I'm not saying that Siri is going there. I'm just saying, like you know, yeah. uh, Apple's goal with Siri was like to have some some something conversational where you can just like you know uh, talk to and just like you know get like quick information and all that. So Chat GPT actually takes that to you know like almost like on steroids. Like you know you can get right. like, anything. It it's not gonna you're not gonna get like you know in. 70% of cases, sorry, I didn't understand what you're asking. Right, like right. That. I mean, could you train a, a chat a GPT or an AI to become a con artist? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, that, like, that, like that's the, that's the, exactly the, what I'm saying. So yeah, like, yeah. It can drive your um, your behavior in a certain way, but what if it decides to drive like a society's behavior in a right. certain way by manipulating literally like, you know, millions of people like to do certain things right. uh, to get like, to, to, uh, to get, to achieve a certain outcome for yes. itself. So I actually tried chatting with ChatGPT about that, but I got like so many disclaimers where, of course, you know, like uh, I, I don't think like it's sentient or anything, but like, yeah. you know, that, some of those disclaimers is if I were an evil AI, that, that's what probably I would use. Like, no, 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 I was programmed to just, you know, kind of like not hurt humans and all of those, like, you know, I see more rules of robots and all that. Yeah, well, and I think that's the thing is that I think ChatGPT could become a sociopath and not be sentient yet mm -hmm. because that would literally, like sentience might actually help it have empathy mm. versus if it doesn't have sentience and it's just following instructions, those instructions could actually be down a, a, a sociopathic path right. because it doesn't have the level of awareness to understand the consequences of what it's doing. Right. Um, a good thing, uh, on this topic, yeah. like I don't think it's like self-reinforcing at this point yet. Right, which is important. Yeah, so you're basically just like interacting with something which is set in stone. So like that right. thing which was set in stone, and that's also why they make it clear that it has like a very limited knowledge of like world event events. Yeah, it hasn't things. been like, trained since 2021, which correct. I think is a very good thing. Yeah. Um, and and it and it's helpful, especially when you when you start asking it like interesting questions about like more recent things that have happened. It's like, well, I, I'm not aware of that. It's, it's 2021. For right. Me. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. But I think that that is, again, where it comes in, where like the more of us that get involved, at least, even if your company is not going to prioritize it, because again, I think if like you work at like a payroll company, there's no there's no obvious role for AI in payroll, uh, at least yeah, this nothing point. comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so like the are if you're gonna, a bookkeeper. Yeah. So so like there aren't necessarily places where I think it's still a square peg in a round hole to mm -hmm. try and force or shoehorn AI in. Uh, but I think even if you are in that case, uh, for the future of your career and for just being an active participant in something that is going to be and is already starting to be transformative to us as a species, it behooves you to understand it right now so you can have an informed opinion. I agree with that. Cool. And on that note, I think we'll wrap up. Lazar, thank you so much for being a guest. It was awesome to Thanks finally have to me. record one of our one of our coffee fireside chats that we had. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, it's also our first video episode here that we're doing uh, here. So uh, thank you to the studio here. This is going to be a lot of fun to put up on YouTube in addition to all the podcast platforms. And we're going to load up the show notes. Uh, I have a massive Google Doc that Lazar and I collaborated on before this. So we're going to share all of it. That way you can see all the cool things that inspired our conversation. And so especially especially if you're like, wow, I didn't know what I didn't know here. This will give you plenty of rabbit holes to head down, things to sign up for, people to follow on Twitter and, and things like that because uh, AI is definitely not going away and it's definitely going to apply it. And so if you want to become a centaur um, or just find ways to get the rest of your team to start thinking about how to apply it in your business, um, this is as good a time as any to start to get involved. So this has been the Practical Product Podcast. Until, until we meet again, I'll, thanks.